Well, welcome. It doesn't seem like it should be Christmas, but it looks like it outside, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, I, it is, it seems that, well, it is as early as it can be. Um, the Advent season is here, and it's, uh, we're here in the midst of this. And so for this season, we're going to be talking about a question, Mary, did you know? And so we're going to be walking through uh, various questions that she may have encountered, some characters that she would have understood certain things about. She would have understood a few things about who they are and what was going on in the story that has been given to us about Christmas. Um, let's pray and then we'll begin. Father, we come and we're just thankful that we can be in this season and we recognize that, uh, as you do, that this is a very familiar story to us. And yet it's this incredible story of you coming for us. And we just ask that our hearts would be attuned to that. Our hearts would be connected to this grand story that you've told and that you've unpacked for us. And God, that we would be closer to you because of how we see your goodness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I do not like questions that are not able to be answered. Things like, do ghosts exist? And if they do, how do we know? Did we invent math or did we discover it? Where does a thought go when it's forgotten? Anybody have an answer for that one? I don't know, right? Like we have these questions that we don't know, but there's this song that has been sung over and over again since 1991. Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know? And some of you, have you heard this song before? Yes, a few times maybe in your life. Uh, the song was written in actually in 1984, and then it was actually first performed in 1991. And it's really this question of what did Mary know? Well, we're going to be taking a look at chapter 1 and 2 of Luke throughout this series. And in each of the times that we have together leading up to Christmas Eve, uh, we will be walking through different participants receiving the good news of Jesus' arrival. And, and what did Mary know? Each of these characters we learn, um, I think we can learn from. And, and how we're going to learn from them is they're all attached to this good news, this good news of great joy that is for all people. Jesus, Christ the Lord, has has come. And so the Gospel of Luke introduces us, and so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. It introduces us to Jesus' mom, and it talks directly about Mary. And so we're going to start with her, and what did she know? There's this incredible place of honor that humanity gives and holds for the mother of the Christ child. And her story is incredible. Her response to the to this personal costly call on her life she is a part of a re, she's a part of a redemptive history and, and it's this amazing story that we have heard and we we embrace at this time of year um but there's much to learn i think also from this story and mary's life so if you have your bibles again turn to luke chapter uh chapter 1 is where we're going to be and uh, part of this story and part of what we're going to look at is that this is not a this is not a myth this is not a a legend it, it's told in a narrative it's told in a narrative style for us to understand and, and we're going to be looking at this first christmas and it says this in verse 26 in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. And so Luke, who is a doctor, begins to write this for us, and he's telling us a story that is set in time and space. There's this incredible collision, incredible collision, of the eternal and the temporal in this moment. It's like God comes in and he intervenes in this moment and, and the heavenly and the earthly come together. The spiritual and the physical come together. And, and it's, it's this, this space between the physical 
And the, the spiritual, the veil is removed for just a moment. And we see something totally incredible in this story. And Luke anchors this story in a, in a time frame. He, he tells us about this. He, in verse five, he actually gives us a little more information and he says, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. This isn't a fable. This is a real story that is historically grounded. It's kind of like this. I think that there's been this popularity to think, oh, well, this is just a great story. And and we have like, you know, Fisher Price has a nativity set all the way up to a font needy. Um, There's just like all of these different nativity sets. And we, we get in our minds, I think, sometimes that this is just a story. It's just a fable, but it's not. It's it's grounded in historical reality, and he gives us these things for us to understand this. It's kind of like it's a, if you were to go to the market afterwards, and you were to look on the shelves of the food, or you were going to buy a product, it would tell you um, something like, you know, best if used by, or born on this date, and this is a, this is a picture of this is set and connected into reality, into historical reality. And there is this this moment and this date that he gives to us. And and Luke, in in his telling of this story, he sets this time stamp on it in historical reality. And then he tells us expiration date of this. And in Luke 2, it'll tell us that this is good news for all people. So it is good news for the people that were hearing it in that moment. And it's good news for us here today that Jesus came, that God uh, came in the body. And, and so there's this time stamp, there's this, this place marker in history that he is giving us in, in the, in the story. You know, part of, Part of um, understanding this story is understanding that it's it's not really just a story. Like if it was just a story, we would start off with different things, right? We would the beginning of this would be, you know, something like you know, long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. We know in that moment that that is going to be a fable. It's not going to be true, right? Once upon a time in a kingdom, we know. That that is, it's a story. Every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot. But the Grinch who lived to the north of Whoville did not. Guess what? There's no place called Whoville. Did you know that? Um, I actually looked it up because I was like, I wonder if there is a town called Whoville. There's actually a road like in Massachusetts or something like that out east somewhere that is like Whoville Drive. But other than that, there is no Whoville, just so you know that. Um, Luke is super specific that this happened in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy when Herod was king of Judah. And Zechariah was serving under the priest of Ijah. And it happened in this little city of Galilee called Nazareth. We have a God who intersected and continues to intersect time and space, even though he exists outside of both of those. Both of those constructs, God, he, he, he exists outside of those, but he intersects in this moment. And why can he do this? Well, because he's God, right? In heaven, there's this heavenly meeting of earth, and it's really an unforeseen thing. It's an unforeseen thing as we we look at this text. Luke in this, I think, is interesting in the telling of this. It's like he tells us this, but it's kind of like, well, the angel Gabriel's there. And it feels too casual to me. I I don't know if when you guys read it, but it feels like, you know, it, it feels casual how he says it. Like, okay, there's this angel. Like, okay, there's this angel, right? Like, that's how I, I want I want him to, like, okay, tell us a little bit more about this Gabriel. But it, it's these two realms coming together, this collision of heaven and earth coming together, this un, unforeseen entering into the scene. And we go on in this story, 
And it is, it goes, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin name, virgin's name was Mary. We know from the context uh, and the scene, Mary is probably a teenager. And this is where it kind of gets a little weird for us for a moment, It gets a little weird because we're like, man, a teenager is getting married. This seems a little odd. This seems a little off. And and yet, um, just if you study sociology or anthropology, do you know that teenagers didn't exist till after World War II? After World War II. Isn't that just fascinating? And I think that that the the trauma of World War II, what happened in that is, is that people started to go, man, we don't want kids to grow up too fast. We want them to hold off on adulting. Now we have that term, right? Like when somebody says they're like 27 and they, they made, a, they got a, have a bank account and they balance their checkbook. We're like, we've been adulting, right? Like it's just like these normal acts of, of, of being adult. But she's a teenager. And so she's really, we have to understand this, that she's a young adult. That's how we have to understand it. She's a young adult in this moment, in this time. And she's betrothed. And she's betrothed. That's a foreign concept for us too. It's it's slightly different um, than than engagement, and and it, it kind of throws us. But remember, this is a Middle Eastern culture. It's not set here in Houghton, Michigan. And so she's a teenager, and she's betrothed, or she's engaged to be married. And when we think engaged, we think of like, man, there's Instagram post of this. There's a Facebook post of this. They, they had this thing all staged. There's a professional to- a pro- photographer that's been out there. And he asked the question. And then you go to get to the, to the place where um, she says yes to the dress type of thing. And none of that's happening. And so it's a little odd to us. What's happening in this moment is this is what happens. The families meet. Um, the father and, and mother of Mary meet uh, the father and mother of uh, of Joseph. And what they do is they really, it's a, hey, how do our families come together? Will this work for the flourishing of our families? And then there's this movement of of some type of wedding um, dowry money type thing. And that's where we're at in the story. She is, she is engaged to be married. All of that that covenant between the two families has already taken place. It's already taken place. And now they're in this place. And, and Joseph and Mary are starting to get to know each other. It's an arranged marriage, if you will. It, it, it's really an arranged marriage by the families. And now they're getting to know each other. And they're in this, this space between, between marriage and, and, or engagement and marriage. This is, it seems different to us. And, and that ordin, that's ordinary. It, it's about to get really extraordinary. It's about to get really miraculous, if you will. And it says, now Mary is a virgin. This is a vital part of Christian orthodoxy. We're told that Jesus is, is begotten by the Father. It means like, it, it's like Jesus came from the Father. Like Jesus, he wasn't created. He wasn't created to do, and we know that the Holy Spirit is going to cause this to happen, and we see this within the text. But in order for Jesus to be fully human and yet for him to be fully God, the virgin birth is essential. This is miraculous. It's marvelous. And and for some of us, it's hard to get our minds around this, just like it's hard to get our minds around an arranged marriage or a teenager getting married. This is even harder and and it's bigger and and it swirls in our head. Yet without it, without this, this miraculous moment set in this place called Galilee, Christianity, it's not there. It's not there. It became about, uh, almost about 20 years ago, it, it became in vogue to say that, well, this is just an ancient understanding, but it wasn't really true. Well, let's ask this question. What do you lose if you lose the virgin birth? Um, 
you lose Christianity. That's right. You lose Christianity. You lose who Christ is. He can't be God in the body. He would be no different than you and I. He would be born of the seed of Adam. All sin comes through that for that first man, and we needed a second man to come. And, and that second man, the second Adam, is, is Jesus. Um, but he can't be born into the sin nature. So what I'm saying by this is, I, I, you could go on a cross and you could say, I'm dying for your sins, uh, the sins of the world, but it would not matter. He was absolutely sinless. He was born without sin, without blemish. Yet he was tempted in every way, just like you and I, to go against, to go against the Father, and he did not. And so he was able to pay for your sin and my sin. Remember, Luke's a doctor. He writes these things down, and he's just like, I'm just telling you, this is miraculous. This is incredible. Now Mary goes on, and, and she has other kids. Uh, and, and this was where we would have um, a, a different understanding than some uh, denomination. So like she had other kids. Jesus had, had had some brothers, and he had some sisters. She had other children. And so we w- would see Jesus being born of a virgin, begotten or produced by the Father as this miraculous thing. Jesus is born in the line of Joseph, who is in the line of David. And, and this fulfills like hundreds of years of prophecy. Then the text goes on. And the angel begins talking to her. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary, um, the question, Mary, did you know? The answer is, yeah, she did, right? Like she understood what was going on. The angel came and he told her, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be the vessel that carries the Savior of the world. She's a young teen, remember, or 18 at this point. She knew though, because she asked a question. She says, how will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. And the angel answers, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who is said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. And then there's this response. And it says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled. And then the angel leaves. And we've heard that story many, many of times. But it's it's miraculous. It's amazing. And I want to just give you three short observations today. One is this. God's mercy, his grace, his sovereign power, when he visits... And he favors. Um, it's always used for his redemptive purposes. And, and he can use anyone, even the most unlikely of people. Even the most unlikely of people. He visits and he favors and then he speaks about his purpose and, his, and the usefulness in the redemptive story. Think about this for just a moment. At this time, Israel is in one of the darkest seasons of its history. It's in the darkest season of its history. God has been silent for 400 years. For 400 years. God hasn't spoke. 
He hasn't sent a prophet. Think about this for generationally. You're hearing these stories of God's greatness. You hear from your grandpa about his grandpa and telling him the story of the parting of the Red Sea. The freedom they found in, in, in Egypt. You hear these stories of David and Goliath and you're like, man, that God's... But as generations go by and you're like, well, where are you, God? 400 years. Where are you, God? So God's not speaking. Remember where this, this is set. This is set in a, in a Roman-controlled place. They're being oppressed by the Roman government. They're being taxed by the Roman government. But not only that, their own people, their own people have kind of betrayed them. And they're, you know, you have like King Herod and, and you kind of go down the line, you have all these people, like hundreds of tax collectors and they're, and they're really from Israel. They're their own people. It's just a dark, dark time. Mary lives in the most unlikely place, Nazareth. It's like a hick town where um, backwards people are, are bred. Like that's what people thought of it at that time. Um, I'm not going to give you any modern parallels because that's just going to get me in trouble, right? Um, but so you can imagine that. The popular saying uh, of Mary in Joseph's day is nothing, nothing good can come from Nazareth. Nothing good can come from Nazareth. And God's like, uh, no big deal, but the savior of the world, um, right? Like that, that's, that, but they understood it as nothing good is coming from there. Mary's from the wrong side of the town. She's young, not married, um, she would have been thought to, to have been a, a vul, as, as vulnerable at best and a really expendable in their culture at worst. From the wrong side of the town, young woman, and, and in their culture, not, not the highest value. And yet the angel Gabriel visits her and says, Greetings, O oh favored one. Oh, greetings, O oh favored one. She has no context to understand how to, to receive this greeting. Nothing in her life or the measurements of their culture showed the favor of God. And she didn't, how would she understand this? Probably pretty poor, wrong side of the town, a teenager. No one in, in their culture or in our culture would be going, man, she is just crushing it in this world, right? Like, no one's saying that. No one's thinking that. She wasn't prominent. She wasn't powerful. She didn't come from a good line of powerful, influential people. But yet she was favored. I, I, was, I that, sat in my office and I was thinking about that. What a powerful statement that Gabriel was speaking into her. What a powerful statement of identity and sense of self. Oh, favored one. God's favor upon her. Society has a number of ways of measuring favor, and, and if we're honest, we're probably all trying to keep up with it at some level. Me too, right? But you don't need any of them. You don't need any of them if you're favored by God. You're the freest of all people. If you find yourself as, a, uh, as an unlikely recipient of God's visitation and favor and, and uh, a participant in the redemptive history of God, man, it's incredible. You are highly favored by God. It's not proven in the stuff she was given and it's not proven in the stuff we're given. It, it, it. Let me just say this. We think of Mary as really special and she is blessed among all women because it tells us that. We're talking about her 2,000 years later and that's true. But if you know Jesus as your Savior, you are highly favored. You are highly, highly favored. 
And it's not, it's not, it's not, um, it's not like you get to carry the Savior of the world, but you get to enjoy the fact that He is prepared to carry you, right? Like He took you from your sins. He took you from that place. Greetings, O favored one. You are highly favored by the Lord. Your sins are forgiven. Your eternity is secured. Paul would tell us that you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I don't know. That seems pretty favored to me. And so we look at this story and I go, man, she was, she was, she was deeply favored or highly favored. And I go, man, us too. Us too. You realize that's so much of our angst, I think, in this world is caused by us trying to live up to society's idea of favor and not heaven's idea of favor. Do not be afraid, child of God. You have found favor with God. That's what he is telling her, and that's the story that is told to us. Through the arrival of Jesus Christ, he, 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 he visited he visited each one of us. He spoke to each one of us. He called us into his kingdom by name that we were able to receive the favor of God through the work of Jesus in our life. The second observation I have is nothing is impossible for a God who is determined to rescue his people. Nothing is impossible for God who is determined to rescue his people. Mary rightly asked a question. She asked a question. Um, how can this be? Why does she ask that question? She's speaking to an angel. I would have a few questions about the angel. I don't know about you, but like there's an angel standing in front of you. I don't care what he's saying in that moment. I have some questions. Um, I'm, I'm, but she's just like sober mind. Like, how can this be? I don't understand. Cause it's miraculous. It's impossible what the angel is actually saying in that moment. So how can it be that I'm a virgin? How can it be I give birth to a child? What's the answer? It's God. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. Just think about this for just a moment with me. This is how big and how powerful our God is. A virginal womb can't stop God when he's determined to rescue his people. He, it can't stop God. Not an, not an old womb either. The, in the background of the story, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, there's this, this story of a lady who should not have a child or should not be pregnant in the sixth month, and she's having a child, and, and it's why. It's because of God chose to do that. We know that Jesus came through the line of David, and yet, um, just think about this for just a moment. In the line of David, there's some dysfunction. There's some dysfunction. Like, God uses this dysfunctional family. Super dysfunctional. There's lots of things in there. It's like Jacob. It's like Jacob is in this line and it talks about Jacob and you go, well, who's ja Jacob's a liar. He lies all the time in the text. He's, he's lying about this and he's lying about that. This is, this is who our God is. He uses a liar named Jacob. He uses a king who commits murder and commits adultery. This is our God. He's bigger than all of those things, all of those dysfunctions in their lives. He's bigger than all of our dysfunctions, all of our sins. Anything that you've done and any place that you've been or anything that's been done to you, God is bigger than all of those things. If he wants to rescue you, he will rescue you through the work and the finished work of, of Christ. There is nothing that can separate us from that. It doesn't matter. You can't, you can't get away. Like when you say yes to Jesus, there is this connection and he is preserving you. He is holding on to you. He will call you back. You can run from him. But what does it say? It says that he will discipline those. He'll discipline those he loves and he'll come after you and he'll come get you. 
You're sealed by Him, by the Spirit's work in your life, by the finished work of Jesus Christ. These are not obstacles for a God. None of our rebellion. None of our moments of faithlessness. None of our sinfulness or folly. None of those are big enough to keep God from getting His way to redeem us and to use us in this world. This, it's amazing. It's amazing. We have a God who interrupts the natural order of things to accomplish his purpose. This is an amazing story of the virgin birth. This is not a nice story. This is a true true story. If God cannot interrupt the natural order, think about this just for a moment. If God could not interrupt the natural order of this world, he ceases to be God. He just ceases to be God. Why can he do it? Because he's the one who created it. And he's God. And so he says, man, I'm going to do this. And so some of you might be going, man, I haven't seen any miracles. That may be true. That may be true. But that you're a Christian following Jesus is a miracle. It's a miracle. Like some of you go, man, I I don't see these things and and, and they don't happen. And... and um. I, I will tell you, I, if you believe that, it will lead you to faithless prayers. It will just lead you to a place that God can't do it. No, God can do it. God can do it. It will lead you to a place of cynicism or skepticism. God is still the same, has the same ability. If we remove that ability... We remove his divinity. Now listen to me that some of you are like, well, God is always doing miraculous things. I drove into Walmart the other day, all snowy and perfect parking spot, miraculous. I will tell you that's not miraculous. Um, When they bring it to your house, that is miraculous, right? That's a miracle happening, right? You are highly favored in that moment, right? Let me just say this. Um, by the very nature of miracles, they're not, like, they just don't happen all the time because it would cease to be a miracle. It would be a Tuesday, right? It, it's, it doesn't work like that. It, it doesn't work like that. But we are full of faith that God can and does and will interrupt his system But he doesn't do it all the time. He does it infrequently. But nothing is impossible for God to rescue his people. He intervenes. He advances his redemptive story, his redemptive history. He saves people. You are a living miracle if you're following Jesus. You were dead in your trespasses. I was dead in my sins. There was nothing that was alive. There was nothing running. And God came and he rescued me. And the Bible says that we were dead and we were made alive in Christ. That's a pretty good miracle, right? That's your story. That's my story. That God made us alive. Let's go on. It says in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. This means bond servant. Um, and, and Mary says, uh, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled. And then, and then the angel leaves. Last observation, Mary's response is with submission, it's with worship, and it's with joy. Um, her her starting place of this is a realization of who she is. She's a servant. She's a, she is a bond servant of the Most High. She understands her position relative to, to God's position. And she says, may your word be fulfilled. I'm like, you're king, you are God, I, I, I'm, I'm there. She comes to that conclusion because she understands who the Lord is. She understands who God is. He's really big, we're really little. When we understand the largeness of God, it's actually kind of scary. But then you you understand the goodness of God, and it becomes really freeing and really amazing. 
And I think in that moment, she understood this. Like, I think there would be some other questions I would have. Like, oh, okay. If the Lord said it, okay, here we go. But like, how what do I tell my mom? Like, how do I tell my mom, like, hey, God came to me, there is this eight. Like, how do you tell your mom that? How do you tell your dad that? How do you tell all these people who are going to look at you this way? Like, how are you going to do this? Like, hey, I know I'm, I'm like... I'm carrying the savior of the world here. Like, you're not, how do you do that? Like, those are the, and she's like, no, no, no. Okay, I'm just going to do this because you said it. When we understand the largeness and the goodness of God, we become willing to release our own outcomes to him. I don't think that's what she does. When was the last time you went before the Lord and went, God, you are sovereign, you are good, well, I have uh, some well-worn paths through my own decisions in life. I, I actually only want what you want for my life because you're good. That's what she does in this moment. You're good, God. I trust you. May your word to me be fulfilled. May your word to me be fulfilled. And, and I think the fear for all of us in this is this. If I do this, it is just going to be this joyless, miserable, like, feel like a soldier, like, do the right thing uh, for God. And that, and some of you go, oh, that sounds good. It, it, but it's like this, all of our will, it's like, it, it's just like taken, and it's just this horrible thing, and it's kind of this, like, just duty type of a life. That's not what the text tells us happened to her. Uh, we're not going to do this today, but there's this, the, the next section of this is this song she begins to sing. She begins to, to, to sing a song as she, she goes and visits her cousins and we're, her cousin Elizabeth. And we're going to talk about that story next week. But Mary busts out in a song of joy. She busts out on a beat of joy. Like, she declares herself a servant forever, and the next thing that comes is a song. I don't know about you, but I don't usually sing when I'm going, man, this is good. It's not, that's not how I do it, right? Like, there's so much joy in her. There's so much like, man, this happened. This is miraculous. This is amazing. I am, I am understanding the goodness of God that it produces worship and joy that she begins to sing a song. That blows my mind. That blows my mind. I don't sing songs that are upbeat and awesome when I'm miserable. I don't think you do either. But she says in the song, that her soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he looked on his humble servant and, and, and for all generations, for all generations, they're going to call me blessed. This is amazing. Like her joy is just kind of coming out of her. Mary did know. She did know what was going on. She did know what was happening. And it produced a song in her. As we close today, I just got a question for you. What's, what song is your heart producing when it comes to God? What song is it producing when it comes to God? What, what song rings in your heart? Is it just kind of a march song? Like, just march? Misery type of a thing? Or is there is this song... That God is good. Man, I'm highly favored. He came for me. He loves me. What's the song of your hearts? Mary's song came when she surrendered. And so yours. Let's pray. Father, we come. And we surrender all to you. All that is ours. All that we are. We want to know your goodness. We want to know your greatness. We knew, know that you came to rescue us. We were dead in our trespasses, and now we're made alive with Christ. And, and you intersected with time and space and in history to, to come for your people. Can I ask that our hearts would be overjoyed in this season?
that our hearts would sing the song that Mary sang, that she had a song that you had given her, the joy of being your servant. God, let it be a joy to be your servant in our hearts this season. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.